Hi, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone who's joining all part of the world. Uh, so it's a sunny day in California with uh, 50 degrees. Uh, so I will give a quick introduction about uh, myself, and then uh, we can uh, go into the topic. So I'm Asan Kabir Singh, uh, Vice President of Solutions Architecture at WSO2. Uh, so I'm an architect and a technology evangelist, uh, uh, talking in different um, uh, forums as well as writing on different uh, technical topics. So uh, since microservices and microservice architecture is a very popular topic among the architects as well as other te technical folks, we thought of uh, conduct a webinar series uh, starting from today. This is the first session and then uh, we will uh, and do the final session on February 24th. So this is a four-part uh, webinar series that uh, today's session uh, based on a talk that I delivered at uh, Gartner ADI last December uh, to have a very high level look at uh, what is the microservices architecture as well as how practical uh, to us and then how we can implement and look at the role of the middleware when we building uh, such architecture and then uh, ad adopting solutions on top of that. The second um, session will be uh, addressing a part of the architecture, so the inner architecture, outer architecture of the uh, uh, microservice architecture that I will uh, explain uh, in detail. So that will conduct by Srinath Perra, Vice President of Research and Frank Lehman, who is a system architect uh, and a consultant at WSO2. And the third one we'll look at, uh, the first two sessions are mainly focusing on architects and then the next two sessions are uh, focusing on the developers who's developing microservices. So the third session we'll look at the inner architecture of uh, the microservice architecture uh, that we conduct by Akkumasi, who's the director of architecture uh, at WSO2, who was um, kind of uh, initiated writing a powerful, lightweight runtime to host microservices. And the last session we'll conduct by Sagara Gunatunga, who's a software architect, who's a software architect, and he is leading the effort on uh, microservices server as well. Uh, that is the lightweight runtime that we are providing to write uh, Java-based uh, microservices in our uh, middleware platform. So hope uh, you will register for these sessions and then uh, attend and get maximum out of our webinar series. So before jump into microservices, uh, let's take a look at how, what and how the enterprise look like today. So basically, uh, the um, if you look at most of the enterprises are uh, defined in this diagram that you will get set of uh, persistent storages like databases and legacy applications and set of services. Top of that you have uh, set of consumer channels nicely done like a web application, mobile applications, and some desktop applications. The problem that we see in the middle that all the integration to develop and provide business functionalities through the consumer channels integrated in a very uh, ungoverned or a, uh, not a, a systematic way. So that's the main issue most of the enterprises facing today. And they are in the process of clearing this mess by using principles like service-oriented architecture. So most of the organizations are not yet there to implement um, or bring the entire enterprise into uh, microservices type of uh, new architecture. So they are in the process of moving and then maybe look at using microservices architecture as a pattern to develop new applications and new services. So that's the reality that we are facing today. So the, uh, if you look at microservices, uh, whether it's a new pattern, actually not really, because I personally experienced this thing in 2011, a service platform in healthcare sector that they started a new strategy. Uh, whenever they write a new service, they spin up a new service container. So it's a practice came from the DevOps side to um, uh, have less dependency between the services as well as uh, whenever they want to do any maintenance to have a less uh, impact to 
rest of the same systems. So they had uh, 80 plus services. As a result, they were running 80 plus service containers. And uh, it was very simple because there were no uh, uh, proper DevOps tools that uh, available today exist on uh, 2011. So they were using shared scripts and Maven type of build um, tools to build in containers. I mean, not containers that we are talking to today, service containers to do that. So it's not a completely new concept that um, we see. So throughout this uh, uh, session, I am using this term called Platform 3.0. That's why I put this uh, slide to explain uh, about Platform 3.0. Uh, so Platform 1.0 is uh, where the main frame and before uh, about the centralized computing. Then Platform 2.0 we uh, categorize as messaging, object orientation, a service oriented architecture, EDA, so and so forth. Basically the distributed computing and internet. That's the most interesting uh, era. And then today we call it as Platform 3.0. Basically the Platform 2.0 plus the next generation middleware that we call as the cloud. So I'm using Platform 3.0 a lot to explain uh, some of the fundamentals that we can find in the microservices architecture. So if uh, we look at microservices uh, uh, with our generation who started uh, uh, starting the uh, started the career uh, in platform 1.0 you know, like people look at like this it's a completely new thing that is not mature enough even to put it into uh, production system. So that's uh, most of the um, IT folks think from our generation. And if you look at the new generation, they think this is the concept or the pattern that only way to develop services that we should or must use microservices as the pattern and the um, framework. But uh, if we look at and what I think it's kind of in between that uh, um, a layer that connect two generations. Uh, the generation who started uh, the services development at this SOA as well as who's um, writing services with the new technologies with microservices. It's a combination or a bridge in between these two generations. And if you look at the fundamentals of microservices, if you see that platform 3.e writes very tightly coupled systems that uh, we um, experienced. And then with the SOA, it came as loosely coupled. Uh, systems and then uh, with the microsystems it's completely decoupled with um, a small set of services. So this is a, a generic um, uh, diagram and then if you look at the same thing in a, a technical diagram you will see the same concept how the tightly coupled services and then loosely coupled services and decoupling can be um, introduced. So concept-wise, uh, it's um, basically um, uh, the same service-oriented concepts uh, that will enhance the capabilities using uh, agility of delivery that we call as rapid application development, continuous integration, continuous delivery, so on and so forth, and flexibility to uh, deploy. So it's basically the same SOA concepts uh, uh, enhanced with the modern application delivery and tooling that we find in uh, today's enterprises. So one misconcept is uh, people think micro is basically the size. Uh, it's not about the size, it's basically how you uh, define the scope and then stick to one scope and uh, create microservices that I will talk in detail uh, throughout uh, this session. Then the, uh, it's basically uh, about um, a service, a microservices addressing a single purpose. That's where the uh, the scope came into the picture, and then it will enhance a loosely coupled nature, and then uh, it makes set of services that independently deployable without any, having any dependency with other services or the system uh, running the uh, data centers. So this is a. Uh, architecture or reference architecture that uh, Gartner released uh, about uh, how and what microservices architecture looks like. So that's where the inner architecture and outer architecture come into the picture that uh, if you see the blue color, light blue color layer uh, in 
the diagram called the outer architecture and then the service implementation layer that we call the inner architecture. So the inner architecture connect with the outer architecture using the message channel layer and then expose the services to the delivery channels through a service gateway. And then there are quality of services added uh, like a service discovery or a platform automation, deployment automation. Uh, so those things are around the outer architecture and then uh, support the uh, inner architecture to be stable as well as be dynamic and uh, deliver the functionality expected. So the, uh, the features of uh, microservices architecture described in many forums, but uh, most interesting posts that I found is from these uh, two gentlemen, um, sorry, uh, two gentlemen, the uh, James Lewis and then Martin Fowler. So based on Martin Fowler's uh, uh, blog post, uh, they have defined some set of main features in a proper microservices architecture. So I picked this list because it's more relevant as well as more uh, practical. Uh, so we will take, uh, I'm not going to go through the list, but let's take one by one and then go through with each and every feature. So first thing is about the componentization as services as we identified in the previous diagram that uh, the uh, loosely coupled services are uh, going more uh, or moving more forward to um, kind of a decoupled uh, set of services. So as a middleware and then uh, from the middleware platform, what we are expecting uh, provide the high performance and functional rich lean service container to deploy services. So uh, WSO2 provide the microservices server that uh, you can uh, get this capability with high performance but very functional rich. So last two sessions of this webinar series will go in detail about our market services runtime. So I'm not going to uh, go in detail to that. In the next uh, feature about organization around business capability, so that's the main uh, differentiation from typical service development into my services because in typical service development, uh, a specific centralized team write the services and then uh, expose it as a set of functionalities or capabilities. But with the new architecture, each and every uh, functional or business um, owners or groups they will write their own services and expose it to the um, uh, other business units or uh, across the organization. So this completely, I mean, um, it did fit into the current organization structures as well because if you look at most of the organizations operate in a modular manner that we create, uh, that we treat small groups as pods. So each and every pod will contain a set of um, uh, set of people that who will be looking at the business functionality and then uh, implement and deliver them as set of services. So the organization structures, modern organization structures completely align with the uh, microservices concept that we uh, are explaining here. So it's basically uh, from the middleware side what we require to enable this provide a platform uh, for different ports to build and expose services because otherwise uh, each and every um, port will develop the stuff in their own way using different type of standards to avoid that as a middleware group or an enterprise architecture group what we should provide a platform that they can come and uh, develop services and concepts like multi-tenancy can be heavily utilized here to isolate different uh, containers and services. So as a reference architecture of this concept uh, that uh, I can explain, you can build different platforms uh, as sub-platforms and introduce like integration, security, governance, analytics, and then provide these business capabilities uh, to enable uh, different uh, uh, service platforms. Then the next concept is called the products, not projects. Again, it's aligned with how we operate today because earlier days when the um, development happened, developers didn't see or they didn't interact with the end customers. It's kind of a factory model that um, the factory build the stuff and deliver, but they never see the customers. But again, the organizations has changed uh, that we call this at product line to front line that the entire organization uh, working very close with their end users and providing uh, business capabilities and 
services to their customers. So the uh, to enable that uh, uh, to get out from these project concepts into a product concepts from the middleware side, what you require is the end-to-end -end middleware capabilities. As an example, I took this platform uh, functional uh, middleware functional uh, diagram that uh, I'm using. Uh, so basically, if you look at it, uh, for a typical organization to build a project, you need different type of middleware capabilities, starting from the data to screen that we call it as system. So system of records to system of record into a system of engagement. So um, a middleware platform that provide all these capabilities can easily enable you different platforms and uh, help you to build products and deliver to your end users. Then the next concept is about uh, smart endpoints and dumb pipes. Basically, currently we are using uh, the integration is based on smart endpoints, but the um, uh, the microservices introduce a, a new concept called dumb pipes. But it's going back to the uh, issue we had with point-to-point -point integration. So this is something that uh, we are not uh, encouraging to implement with uh, microservices architecture. So the problem is you can start with this point-to-point uh, -point connectivity and then it will end up with the same uh, messy situation that I explained with a lot of integration that you can't manage. So the solution is to uh, have a middleware capability to uh, provide bust and broke architecture pattern. So that way you can stick to the uh, usual enterprise integration patterns and bring them to integrate different systems with microservices platforms and have a proper uh, integration layer with your internal and external systems. So if we extend the uh, microservices architecture with the bust and broker, uh, if you look at, uh, at the bottom left uh, that I have put the bus and bus and the broker uh, and connect the external systems. It will connect through the message channel layer and then enable microservices to consume different business functionalities and data through uh, the message channels. The next concept is decentralized governance because if you have a centralized governance framework, what will happen? Uh, the uh, same uh, patterns and principles or the policies will be applied uh, to the um, any application built or any service built in the system. So uh, to have more creativity ha as well as more freedom to write uh, microservices, we can't allow that. So we need to have decentralized governance. So that's where the some of the concepts that we can pick from platform 3.0 come into the picture. Uh, first thing is uh, enable APIs so that way people can can come and uh, build applications without uh, changing much of the business unit, business logic, uh, by consuming the business logic and data through the APIs, as well as provide the freedom for the developers to write application using whatever the um, desired language that they want to use. So that's where the polyglot programming comes into the picture, that they can write applications using Java, PHP, JavaScript, uh, .NET, so and so forth. So the, uh, if you look at the API layer in the uh, functional diagram, that it comes in between the SOA layer or the services layer and the consumer channels that we develop to deliver different type of business functionalities. Then the uh, next concept uh, described in microservices architecture is decentralized data management. Uh, the typically what happened, it's a central data store, but with the microservices architecture, it's a decentralized data stores that uh, many, uh, each and every uh, service will have a one-to-one -one relation, no uh, one-to-many, but not a central data storage that we see because data will be isolated with the business units as well. To implement that, uh, what we need is a proper event-driven architecture. If you can remember the message channel we had in the microservices architecture diagram, message channel will enable uh, eventing and then each and every service can use PubSub and subscribe to different uh, data um, update events and then uh, communicate uh, in between different data stores and get the uh, data out from uh, different data. So that way that you will not duplicate the data, but still the messaging will enable to share data across different uh, microservices. Uh, 
Then the infrastructure automation is critical that how you uh, automate everything. That's how you can quickly release your microservices. Uh, so from the platform 3.0 concept that the uh, DevOps friendliness come into the picture that you will enable different type of uh, DevOps capabilities uh, to have automated testing, continuous integration, and support for containerization. So that's the key uh, that uh, we have the uh, capabilities and support for containers like Docker and then uh, the uh, other frameworks like Kubernetes that support or enable uh, Docker in production systems. And then different type of DevOps automation like Puppet, Chef, and uh, Vagrant, different type of automation uh, script support. And then uh, support for distributed deployment, that how you can deploy them in the public cloud, private cloud, and then uh, once you deploy at one place, how it propagate across your different uh, cluster nodes, so and so forth. And then the lean independent runtime because if the runtime is not lean and quickly, uh, the start time is not uh, uh, significantly low, uh, it's a problem because you can't start up a new container or a new runtime and then add it to your cluster group. The next uh, feature that uh, comes in microservices architecture about design for failure actually, again this is not um, new, uh, even these crash only implementations were available long time that how you write applications by considering uh, the uh, failure situations. So in uh, platform 3.0 concept that we get two things, big data analytics and DevOps. Big data analytics actually uh, help you to detect any issues at the runtime as well as to predict any issues that might come in your de deployment. So that way you can have a proper um, uh, system that will act quickly and then fix any failure situations. Then DevOps friendliness also helps here that if a certain set of instances goes down that you can quickly spin up new set of instances, uh, bring it to the same state and then uh, provide the same uh, functional capabilities as well as uh, to have the, uh, the capability to handle the load or the scalability requirements will uh, come into the picture there as well. Then uh, the next feature talking about the evolutionary design so that's the concept that we explain in Platform 3.0 that the iterative design that you will um, uh, develop the services and the applications on an iterative manner and then improve them um, and release them quickly with the uh, quick release uh, practices that we are introducing with uh, DevOps automation. So the, uh, from the middleware side, what it required is a pluggable, extensible middleware architecture because you will find different type of uh, requirements that you um, need to develop your microservices as well as microservice architecture. So extensibility is a key thing in the middleware stack that you need to um, pay attention. And this is aligned with this is uh, the concept called uh, pace layer strategy that how you can uh, introduce innovative ideas into the system that you build a platform and then you use the uh, uh, microservice architecture as a framework and microservices as a implementation and allow business units to have share the common ideas and then introduce better ideas as well as think about new ideas and implement on top of that. So the um, as a middleware vendor, we uh, provide all these different capabilities, uh, kind of a summarized version of the functional capabilities that I explained earlier, the API management, then uh, service development or uh, application development layer, and then the integration, dashboard, security, and analytics, as well as as a delivery channel, you can enable mobile and IoT as well. So if we map the product stack into the previous uh, microservice architecture that I explained, uh, you can find the runtime or the service writing runtime will be the microservices server um, and then you will find the API management layer as the gateway to expose these microservices server services and then governance registry that uh, we have will expose these services and then uh, advertise them in an API store as well as a service store and then create dependencies between services and the 
APIs. And then to extend the uh, uh, communication in between microservices as well as uh, with the outside world, uh, Enterprise Service Bus and Message Broker will come into the picture. And Identity Server bringing the security uh, component into the microservices architecture and a data analytics server that we have providing the analytical capabilities to microservices architecture. And the, um, the rest of the technologies like Docker, Kubernetes, Puppet uh, will enable the uh, containerization as well as how you can dynamically uh, scale these uh, solutions in a uh, production deployment. So in summary, uh, in this 30 minute uh, webinar, so what we uh, discussed basically build an architecture uh, using API driven, consumer driven nature and then uh, minimize and utilize the infrastructure op uh, and then optimize it. Then dynamic uh, act based on the runtime events like it can be a data update event or it can be a system level update in it and then be iterative and uh, implement your solutions and then platform, build a platform for innovation and rapid application development. So the, but um, uh, without losing the good stuff that we did with earlier architectures, like uh, without losing the existing application and data because still we need it with the microservices architecture and then good service oriented architecture principles and then the middleware capabilities like integration and tooling, uh, we can uh, use them a lot and distributed deployment with uh, functional containers. So those are the things that we should not lose by uh, introducing the microservices architecture. Uh, so uh, that's uh, uh, about the introduction to this uh, webinar series. And then I hope you will join to rest of the um, uh, webinars and then uh, go in detail about the outer architecture, in architecture as well as the uh, uh, runtime that we provide uh, you to write microservices. So if you have any questions, I can take a couple of questions uh, quickly um, and then answer them. Looks like there are no other questions. Um, so uh, we hope you will join uh, and enjoy the rest of the uh, webinars in this series. Thank you and then hopefully meet you in another webinar.